Welcome to the podcast Komoto. My name is Christina Petersen and today my guest is Richard. Rich. <laughs> and um, uh, I know I'm not so good in, in telling a lot about my guests, but I know my guests are very good to tell a lot about themselves and that you can get closer to them and to know them and Yes, you can do this by the questions I will put to Richard. So, hello, Richard. Uh, hello. Rich. Yes. Good morning and good afternoon from across the pond, you could say, right? Yes, for me it's afternoon and for you it's morning. Morning, yes, yes. Early yeah. morning. Yeah, nine o'clock, nine a.m., yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 That leads Thank you me for having me on. That leads me to the first question. Where are you at the moment? Um, I uh, live in Scottsdale, Arizona, which is the um, southwest area of, of, of uh, United States near uh, Mexico and California and so forth. So very warm area. Uh, we get to stay outdoors most of the time. So it's kind of, it's nice in the for 10 months out of the year, kind of warm in the summer months. So everybody gets out of here during the summer months. So. so I don't want to talk about my weather at the moment. It's raining hard. So uh, let's, yeah. <laughs> let's move to another <laughs> topic. And um, who was the first, first person who spoke to you about the Fangrass method? Well, that's a really interesting question. So um, I was, uh, you know, I, I was in a gym where I was getting massages, you know, work out and then I would get massages. And um, at the time I was doing that, um, there was, I was uh, getting, uh, I wouldn't call it Rolf, but it was really deep massages. And uh, my daughter, um, had just been diagnosed with a, um, a rare form, something called spinal muscular atrophy. At the time, it was called Werning Hoffman. Um, that's 30, she's 36, so about 32 years ago. Um, and uh, this uh, massage therapist said, Did you have you ever heard of this stuff called Feldenkrais? And I was like, What? what? What are you talking about? I didn't, I really didn't pay any attention to it. And then um, um, uh, at the time, at the time I, I was, uh, because, you know, my, my life was upside down because of my daughter's uh, diagnosis, um, I, I was seeing a therapist and he said, we were talking and he said, uh, you ever hear this stuff called the Feldenkrais method? And it was like within two weeks of each other. So it was like, Somebody going whacking me here and whacking me there. Said, Wake up, we're trying to tell you something. So that's a long story to a short answer, but that's literally within two weeks, I knew nothing about it. And then the Nathan Shones uh, uh, were uh, not far from me in because I, I grew up in Chicago and, and worked and lived in Chicago all my life. And they, I got in touch with them and then one thing led to another and had lots of different down the road kind of ideas, so. I don't know how much you want to know about that, so. Yeah, I think it's far away. <laughs> uh, so yes, someone talk about the Pancras method and when was the first time you got contact by, by doing or by uh, having um, a lesson? Yeah, so, <laughs> so once, so once um, I found out from these two people where, who I could talk to about, it um you know i was this uh guy from chicago and and before anybody was going to touch my daughter to get a lesson well they were going to give me a lesson right right i, I want to have the experience i don't want to put her in any harm's way and i was much i was a lot a lot more muscular than i was then and and and, and so her, her name was uh margaret mcintyre and she she I think she lives in Hawaii now. It was just the sweetest lady in the world. Um, and I went to her to have a lesson. I didn't feel anything different. I had a lesson from her. Um, I didn't feel 
anything different whatsoever. I was like, well, it didn't hurt. I don't really know much, but okay. And she says, well, if you really want somebody to work with your daughter, there's a woman named Anath Banyal, um, and she lives in San Francisco. And so I said, well, okay, I'll, I'll call her. And Anath was in, I think she was pregnant at the time, or had just given birth uh, to her daughter. And I called her up long distance. You remember those big um, cell phones we used to have, they used, to, they were these big things you have to carry around, right? That's how long ago it was. And I called her up. I said, she goes, well, I'm not seeing anybody. And I said, no, no, you don't understand them. We're on our way out there, you know? And she says, oh, I'm not I said, no, you're going to see us. And so then, uh, she gave me a couple lessons and then, uh, she started working with my daughter, Annie. Um, and so we spent, uh, eight years going back and forth from Chicago, uh, Andy getting lessons, and that's how I got literally had started getting lessons myself, and then uh, got introduced to the method and so forth and so on. And that's when, you know, you know, that, that's a different story, but that's how I got into the yeah. my first real experience of the of the method. So am I right? You you had a couple of lessons with Anat, or only one to? I I think I had two at the very beginning. Um, but, but, but uh, it was, you know, it was like, I'm, co we're coming out to San Francisco. I'm not going to come all the way out there. It was like going it, from Chicago to San Francisco is a, it's a long flight. Yeah. Uh, right. Right. It's like a five hour flight with, you know, two babies at the time. because my, we, my wife and I had our, our second daughter, uh, by the time we started singing that. Um, and so we weren't going to come all the way out there not to have lessons. I knew that it wasn't going to hurt. So I had a lesson and then I think Annie had, a, had her lessons and we would have two weeks worth of, Annie, my daughter would have two weeks worth of lessons and then we fly back to Chicago. And I, I don't know how far down that process, I think it was the second or second lesson and that said to me, uh, why don't you come to a workshop if you really like this work, you know, as you know, I don't really remember uh, the exact phrasing of it. And so I went and did this experience of, of a workshop and, and uh, she said, well, if you, if you think it's worthwhile, why don't you try two weeks worth of a training? And then I, and then I went to two weeks worth of a training. I said, well, I love it. And so then I went and became, started becoming a practitioner. I know that a lot of people sometimes have at the first time so the experience of I like it but really um, I will move on so they stay they they can't say exactly what it was what they they yeah. like and but now really about 30 years later can you tell something about what was this, what kept you um, being interested in the method? So not only by like testing who is working with your child, what, by the way, I think that's so, so nice because sometimes it's like parents give the, the child to the practitioner. That's also good. I, I'm not against it, but then, um, it's it's a nice move to say, oh, I want to know what's going on, so that right. I can understand or maybe guide my my child better. And also, I think for a lot of people with special needs children, they also need sometimes this um, special time for them to maybe um, be more uh, that they can stay good at the side of their children. Yeah, the sure. Process. So. Sure. Yeah, we, can, we. I would say it a little differently. I would say that I could understand what Aunt Annie was going through and what her experience was and and, and how to move from there. Uh, it, it, it made sense to me. Now, how, how, my, my experience was different. It, and I think the similarity of what you said was, I really didn't know what kind of made it feel right to me. 
Um, but but I think uh, something on a, a on a nonverbal level uh, allowed me to feel like I, I can strip away a lot of of things that I learned that really weren't true or weren't necessarily helpful on a certain level that I really liked and, and made sense to me. Um, and I thought, well, that, that's a good idea. I mean, it, but, but it's, it's a bigger, broader picture than that. You know, it's kind of like, well, you look at this one, you know, somebody takes a picture of an x-ray and say, well, that's the problem. Or not. Well, that's just a picture. So I had lost my father. Uh, he was ill, and I, uh, you know, and then um, besides losing my father, you know, I wasn't happy in the work that I was doing, and so those those different components, right? And so then I did this two weeks with somebody, and all of a sudden it was like, oh, well, that feels harmonious to me. That feels it feels right uh, after all this other stuff um, so why not go ahead and try it and that's really the, how I went about doing it when I said Trish my wife let, you know I'm not giving up my work I can go two weeks and come back you know that's how our you know, two and a half weeks that's how our training was set, uh, situated was two and a half weeks and then we go away and then come back two and a half weeks and did that three three times a year so it made sense to me, well, let's just try. And I just did. So that's how I got here. I don't know if, I hope that answers your question. Yes, of course, of course. Everything is maybe interesting. And it shows also, I think a little bit more about the Fancraft method when I work with someone in particular, it's more like I giving in a question like with my hands on the person and I'm looking and looking for what is coming back, how to, um, and then I will take this and we go further on. And that's so, so nice. And sometimes I have to ask myself when I put this question and, oh, it's interesting what he, he answers. But, and so, Did I say something <laughs> shocking? Did I, did no, I say something no, no, no. <laughs> no. Anyway, it's, it's very, <laughs> very interesting. And I, I want to know more closely, what was your work then? You, you were a sportsman <laughs> or sport was your hobby or you were in a completely different field? Yeah, so I was in a completely different field. Um, I grew up, I uh, went to university and got, was an accountant. And then after an accountant, I went to um, the commodity exchange. It's like the New York Stock Exchange, except bigger, where people jump up and down and yell and scream and buy and all kinds of crazy stuff. Uh, and I did that for 13 years. Um, and I tell people it's a great way to make a lot of money. It's just not a great way to make a living. Um, uh, and I remember uh, in the midst of you know transferring between uh, trading on the and I was on I was on the what's called the floor. It was actually on the 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 area that they call where people exchanged you know and traded together. Um, and I was risking my own money. Um, and I remember saying to my wife, um, you know, I don't like the person that I'm becoming in order to stay here. Cause, cause you take more and more risk, you know, you, as you take more and more risk, you get thicker and thicker skin. And so you, it's not, you, you're not a nice person anymore. I mean, there, there are few and far between, but, 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 but as you take more and more risk, you really can't care as much about the people around you. And, and some, some part of that didn't, didn't match up to me. I, I'm always been pretty empathetic and never like to see people in pain. Um, even when I was a, a child, I remember that. And, and so when you're losing money, you're in pain. And so when friends of mine were in pain, I was like, ah, that, or when I was losing money, you know, that was painful. So I was like, ah. So, but you had, so as, as you got bigger, more and more successful, you traded more, you know, your risk got big, bigger and, and so your skin got thicker. So you 
couldn't really care that much anymore. So that's where I was. And then, of course, kind of, you know, when I was getting, you know, I would, I would trade and then I would go work out and then I would go get a massage once a week. And that's where I heard about, started hearing about the method. So I kind of okay. make full circle. So that's like a circle, I understand. It's like you more money, more risk, more tension in the muscles. Then you go to the massage therapist. Yeah, right, right, very much. And, yes, and also, very much. And, yeah, that's so interesting because I think what you're telling about is it's about the stress level was very high. And that's, It's, it's referring uh, what I said uh, maybe about the parents with special needs children uh, with a special right. needs child. It's also another kind of tension and, and stress because it's what we are going through. It's, it's so different, but it's at the end, it's the stress and the how to level it down or at the end, how... Um, what you said about that you also were at a point that you can see that is changing your personality very much yes so yeah. that's yeah. yeah so it's not my first uh, talk to to someone who is a pancreas practitioner and it's so interesting that there are mainly something in themselves what is talking to them i'm at the yeah. moment at a place that it's not the right place for me it's not fitting my personality i can do it i i can like imagine that you are good at it like strong and you're going through that but you knew it's not really the right place for you and maybe for a lot of people it's not the right place where they yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, you know, it, it, I, don't, I don't know, maybe bring a, a, a heart surgeon or a brain surgeon or something like that, you know, where somebody's life is in your hands in the moment. Um, I don't think there's anything more stressful as an occupation because it, it, than that, uh, you know, it's not that you, you know, like you do it, like there are a lot of professional athletes down there. Um, And so they would say then the stress level was the same because you have to bring that, when you trade, you have to bring that level of energy up to where you are because if you don't, there's not anybody there who cares that you didn't. I mean, you're going to lose money and so be it. I mean, it's not like they want you to lose money, but they want to make money. And so, you know, you have to bring that up. Well, to bring it up every day, It wasn't just what, you know, if you had to do it one day, well, maybe, you know, but two, you know, then all, but every single five days a week, it made it um, difficult to do. But, you know, my family came from that. My father was involved in it. My brother was involved in it. And, and so, you know, I just went, not the family business, because we all had our own business, but, but, but it was in the same line of that and, and risk taking and, I like part of it. There's still part of me that likes that, you you know, that adrenaline rush, you know, I mean, that's part of, my, you know, I, I, it's part of, I was talking with a, a trainer uh, of the Feldenkrais method and we were we, good friends and, and she works a lot in Germany and her name is Olena Nightfor and she's just lovely to work with and lovely to, to, to exchange uh, ideas with. And um, if you ever have a chance to work with her, I think the world of her. Um, but we were talking about it and I said, I love the rush of being in front of, especially athletes where high, and because I've, I've worked at the highest level of, of athletes. And when they, and they, you know, they don't like, why should I believe you? You know, I see, I get off on it. It's like, I'm excited about that because I know this stuff really works. So give me a shot, right? You know, so lots of stories about that that I could tell. But I, so I get on, you know, in the, that rush that you would have to have on the floor, I just channel it into that arena and feel very comfortable there. Yes. And I'm so happy to talk to you because I think you, you like uh, to gamble. And I can imagine your first job was also at the beginning a gamble and it's, it's 
yeah, it stays like a gamble, but there was some shadow about it for you. So you thought about something else. But now I can say as a fan price <laughs> practitioner by myself, you need this kind of um, like gambling um, all the, the day long, because that's the method about to be like very playful with each of the client. And even when the client is like, convinced if you you stepped over the first uh, playful game how to attract or how to give um, them the idea oh yes I really should go to this lesson or to this workshop uh, and they are with you if you stop gambling or like bringing new things into the game it's not right. anymore the fan price word do you see the a connection you you would say okay or you want to add something yeah so i don't think gambling is the right word i don't think it it, it kind of has the right um doesn't convey the same idea i think risk taking is um a better way for me to to convey that idea i think when i traded on the floor there was a lot of risk but it wasn't gambling it was analyzing different things in the moment as things were happening and so forth and so on. And, you know, you would take a risk and then you would get out if you lost or get back, you know, make money if you won. In the same context, I think, especially, well, it's all practitioners, but I, what I would like to say, because I've been doing this for 30 years to, to younger practitioners is if you're not willing to, to put your toes on the line and say that somebody to somebody, look, this, this stuff really works. Why should somebody believe you? It doesn't mean that you have to explain to them why it works or how it works, but it works. And you just need to say, look, have an experience. I mean, do you want me to talk about one of those experiences I had? Yeah. Because it's one of the things that, yeah, okay. So, so I got to work um, with Arizona State University baseball team. Now, in in, in, in the United States, and especially in Arizona, where it's warmer weather, baseball is a really big deal, right? And to work with this Arizona State University baseball is at the highest level, right? It is, you know, right before professional, and there's a lot of young men who go to the play there so they can go play professional baseball. And um, when my youngest daughter was growing up, she played baseball with the boys instead of playing softball with the girls. Because I knew baseball, I didn't know, I didn't know softball, so I, I knew baseball. So her coach, she used to go to baseball clinics, and so her coach used to play for Arizona State University, and his son was having back problems. And so the coach and I started talking, this is after, right after I graduated. Um, and I said, I can help your son out. I don't, I don't even want any money. I don't want any money. You're helping my daughter out. Here you go. And he goes, great, I'll send him over. And he sent him over and his back was better and right away, it was no big deal. It was like any third year student could have done the exact same thing. Well, he said to this guy down at Arizona State University, his name is Pat Murphy, who is now the bench coach for the Milwaukee Brewers, he said to, he, he, his nickname is Murph. He said, Murph, you got to check this stuff out. Well, I had to call Pat Murphy literally 10 or 12 times to get in to see him, right? And he finally said to me, okay, come into the office, let's talk. So I drove down to the university, which is not far from my home. And I sat there and we, and we talked. And I, Finally, I said to him, listen, Murph, if I can't do what I say I can do, if you can't change and you can't improve, you'll never hear from me again. I'll never bother you. I'll never. But if I can't, but if I can, then I get to work. You know, you're, you're going to send your, your team to see me. All right. And so he finally was like, OK, you're ready. Leave me alone. Fine. I'll come see you. Well, he actually thought that he actually thought that he was got the better better end of that deal because he was a pitcher and he had a pin in his shoulder from an injury. 
So he couldn't move his shoulders. So he said, okay. So he came to my office and he, and he said, okay. I said, okay, Murph, what is it that you want? And he's like, he's got this like smirk on his face. And he said, I want to wash my hair with my left hand. I want to be able to bring my hand in the back of my head. I said, yeah. And he goes, yeah, but I have a pin in my shoulder, my left shoulder, and I can't do that. So what are you gonna, you know, how are you gonna do, how are you gonna help me? Well, we all know in Feldenkrais, there's a, a thousand ways you can bring that your hand to the back of your head, right? Literally in like five minutes, his hand's back here. And, and he goes, oh my God, how did you do that? I've been, you know, 20 years I've been waiting to, you know, and I said, well, now I have to see your pictures and catchers. And he was like, absolutely. So for 10 years, I worked with his team over and over and over again. So that's that's the, the the thing about stepping up and taking the risk was to this guy who's you know the the highest level of of baseball I said I can do this I can help you but if you're not willing to take that risk how's anybody going to believe you right so that's a you know and, and Murph and I are still good friends and, and, and everything so I you know he doesn't mind me talking about him like that <laughs> So I'm totally convinced too. <laughs> and I think it's about you that you can say this. And also I want to say to other people who hear this or watch this, that maybe they take the risk. What can be wrong about to try it once and then to see, because my experience is a little bit like you said before they come or for one lesson and Sometimes I had the situation they didn't show up after that or, but then two years later, they say, oh, maybe <laughs> I should have come earlier. Now it is worse and nothing else worked. <laughs> so, right, right, right. Well, yeah, in, in that idea though, that, that I, I don't mean to be rude, um, in that idea is that you need to tell people that they're going, they're, they're going to feel different and 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 that's a context because with with Murph he was one of the first Highland athletes that I worked with but but as I worked worked more and more and more with the the level of athletics and then I transferred it to just anybody was you're going to change how you're going to change I don't know yet but you're going to change as long as you own the change, we have a wonderful discussion to be had. If you don't want to own the change, then that, then maybe I'm not the person for you, right? Because- Yes, of course. Know, yeah, it's like, you know, yes. you know I, and that's okay with me. And what was the change for you? So um, during the training, maybe what came up for you? What was your change? Uh, I don't know. We have enough time. <laughs> <laughs> pick one. Pick one. <laughs> I, I think. Um, I think becoming softer, um, being more vulnerable. I think is was the biggest, uh, um, biggest change. And I still work on that. I think that's an ongoing thing. Um, so. Um, much broader, not uh, uh, much more uh, muscular than I am. I was then than I am now, um, and I had a you know this you know six pack ab and you know you know and I was and defined by other people what was fit. Um, and I remember getting a lesson from one of the assistant trainers in my training. And I was on all fours and she said, and she had her hand on my belly and it was, you know, every, you know, where you kind of sink the chest and, or sink the belly and you know, all that kind of idea. Um, and she said, drop your belly. And my, and my stomach was so chronically held. I mean, I couldn't do it. I couldn't hold it. But, so, so it was an interesting, but the, the, the thing I think that the, that happened to me, I got really fortunate that the first lesson in my training I got from Carl Ginsberg. 
and um, it was a lesson um, leaning over. So I'm in San Francisco, you know, uh, I think everybody in San Francisco is, is a gay man, you know, I mean, it's just, just total stereotypical, just idiot kind of an idea, right? And Carl puts me leaning over the edge of the table, I'm, you know, and he's moving my butt all over the place, right? And I'm like, oh my God, what did I get myself into, right? <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> and, and I got off the table and then I was like, oh my God, what a freeing feeling. And it was fantastic. And so that kind of like opened me up to kind of throw away all those, all, start, start throwing away all those preconceived notions and everything like that. So uh, that's a couple of them you asked it. So that's yes. kind of how I got there. Yeah, that's interesting. Be um, I know uh, I can resonate with your experience because I, also I was more, very sportive and I was um, a lot of time off my bicycle so strong legs and mother of three children so holding everything up and yes when I stood my my arms tend to to look like I was holding babies all the time <laughs> even when they are not there so and um, it was so helpful to have the, the FI to get rid of all these patterns because they they were so um, inside me and I didn't need it when I I stand or that's and it wasn't helpful to play the piano to be so stuck in this solely so I'm from the musician side yes it's it's not not good but it was so inside me to and it was very good to to can uh, that I can do it when I need it, but I can uh, lose it or I can let go of it if I don't need it at the moment or I need other things. And that's really something interesting. And um, maybe some people think, okay, I, I want my nice muscles at the, stomach and everything because it's beautiful and they don't want to lose but you said something else before about that you are more vulnerable now and why is this good to be more vulnerable vulnerable yes yes Vul yes yeah yeah, yeah I, I think um it takes a lot of work to put up this facade this uh, it takes a lot of effort, a lot of energy to kind of like, you know, and which is not, it, it's not genuine. It, it's, um, can I be um, aggressive now uh, if I want to be? Sure, I can, I can do that. Um, but I don't, I don't have to be like, uh, uh, habitually or chronically aggressive. I mean, that is a, a chronic way of being. I, don't, I, can, I can be more um, genuine, more real with myself than, uh, than trying to be something that I'm not is the best way to put it. And so by doing that, I, I, I have more uh, uh, ability um, to choose how I want to react to different situations. It's not, it's not that I, 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 can, I can't be, I, I certainly can be aggressive um, and I can be extremely soft. I just get to choose which way I want to be instead of thinking I have to be a certain way because I don't. Yeah, that answers your question. Yes, um, wonderful. I think it's a good explanation of yeah. Um, oh, it's yeah. You see, I'm stumbling <laughs> because it's really um, 
what what I think that we have more potential emotionally in our movements and that also causes sometimes that we may be so no I can't do this oh that we we think something earlier or we can we think we are not so compulsive in our behavior that is something what can come out if you do Feldenkrais yes like me before sometimes it's so easy I'm holding like uh, my babies all the time and then I'm used to it so much that actually my arms are like this and that's or it's on another emotional level or on an level like how I act in generally in general in, in the world yeah uh, maybe now is the right moment to ask you um, so I remember you did your training in San Francisco and Same with that, right? yeah yeah yes and you stepped right away into your praxis with your baseball team and everything and did you move on into into another kind of are you involved in fan Christ trainings or something else or in giving yeah. so, so I'm an assistant trainer yeah I'm an assistant trainer and um, I've worked in a pretty internationally I think it's important I, I wanted to kind of step back I think it's important to understand that that I didn't just go from um, trading on the floor commodities to Feldenkrais. I went from trading on the floor to working via the telephone and trying to trade that way. People wanted me to do that. And in between that, I would do Feldenkrais. And then it was like, well, that is not really working. I mean, it was okay, but it's like, you can't be half pregnant. Either you are or you're not, right? <laughs> it's, it's like, you can't be maybe yes, maybe no. It's either you are or you're not. Or either you're trading or you're not. And I was like, no, I, I don't want, that's not what I want to do. But, I, but there were approximations, as in Feldman, because we know there are approximations along the way, finally getting me to make that commitment. And I would have uh, a client here or a client there, and then I would have the base, some of the baseball team, and then I, you know, they, that season would be over, but then I, you know, have a you know, different car. And then it would build up. You know, but it, that was over a period of time. So I want to be clear about it. It wasn't like I stopped stopped my training. I had this full practice. It 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 moved and grew and was part of that. It it just didn't happen overnight. I want to be really clear about that. Yes. You know, okay. Be like oh my god, I'm feeling it. I have full practice. And it's like no, no, no. It takes a while, but you do have to be out there. And, and, and I, yeah, so to, to get to the question you asked, yes, I, I, um, I do work in trainings. I do, uh, I come over to Europe. I've, I've been to London uh, quite a bit. Um, I was over in Vienna a couple of times um, doing a part of a training there and then part of two trainings there and then part of oh, one training there, I'm sorry. And then I gave a couple of workshops there um, and so, yes, I, 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 I'm very comfortable, um, teaching practitioners and also comfortable being in front of everybody, you know, everybody else just talking about the work. I just, you know, so I don't know if that's, yes, that's, answer. um, what is springing into my mind is that we are so much talking about what uh, what the Feldenkrais method does to you, did to you, or um, and also I mentioned a little bit about my process, but how, how do you think it works? So who is not so familiar with the Feldenkrais method at the moment, what do we do and why is this so deep uh, working? <laughs> what do yeah. you see? Because you have such a big side to trainings, uh, to formations, to your work, you, in your family and everywhere. And yes, yeah. I so, stopped talking uh, now. <laughs> yeah. 
But I think it's a great question. So, so um, let me answer it in two different ways because I think it it really speaks to one part of my my practice but it speaks to the whole practice. So I think one of the things we say to people is, look, you know, you, you have to meet people where they are. You can't expect them to move and understand what we do. That, I mean, Moshe would say, you know, uh, what's the, you know, what is it about the, the, the method that makes it so spectacular? How do, how do you give a great lesson? And what he said was in Amherst, he goes, love. He goes, we meet people and accept them how they do what they do in that moment and don't try and change them, right? And I think, I think that's really to the essence of the, your question. You know, we, we meet them there and we say, hey, what do you think about moving like this? Or what do you think about thinking something like that? If it doesn't work, throw it away. I don't care. That doesn't make a difference to me. I'm, this is your lesson, not mine, you know, you know, so, so we meet people there in that same context. I think it is one of the biggest mistakes if you're going to work. Um, well, it's really with anybody, but if you're going to work with an athletic community, you have to understand two things. One is they have a ton of people that are trying to work with them. And so you're gonna have one or two times that you're gonna have a chance to show them a difference. So you better show them a difference, number one. Number two is go meet them where they are. Don't expect them to do the bell hand when they're a rugby player or a football player. So they don't want it. Them. Can you just explain a, bit, a little bit what, what is the bell hand? For me, it was like, oh, maybe yes, it should have you. been thank you, thank you. the first thank lesson you. because I'm a pianist. So, yeah. <laughs> yes, for me, so, it was so, like. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, thank you for that reminder. I appreciate it. So, so the movement of the hand in a really slow, methodical way, and, and and the, the image of the hand in the brain is very large. So when you slow the hand down and soften the fingers and soften the hand, it has a tendency to soften a lot of chronically held patterns in you, which will show up all through you. The, the point is that you really have to soften yourself in order to do that. It's, and it's a lot, I mean, it's a lovely lesson. It's beautiful. And can I add something? For me, it was also as a pianist, maybe I tend to have a, a certain pattern in my hand because yes. I'm playing, but my brain was so used to be so concentrated on the movement of my hand. So it was familiar for me to do this. Yes. Yeah, that right. also might be interesting to know about it. That is, it's the right door for me. So to open up for my experience, because there are a lot of patterns and I'm used to, to, to be so clear and so aware of all my parts of my hands and arms, of course. But, you know, that was really an amazing experience for me to do the bell hand. So, yeah. 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 And, and I think your, 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 your example is spot on that you're able to feel sense that because of your patterns of your yeah. habits right but if you're but if you're a football player and you're knocking into people or heading the ball or you know doing it you're not gonna it's it's you, you're not meeting that person where they are you're you're asking them to come to where you are instead of meeting them where they are and so you know, I, I worked with for three or four years, I worked with a football team. And, and the first thing I did was take them into very vigorous lessons. I, these are big young men, like 350 pound men, 19, 20 years old. I want them to be vigorous. I don't want them to do the bell hand. I want them to, and, and then I moved them 
towards the softening and then build them up again, but not at the beginning. So, so in our work, we say to people, meet them where they are. Well, yes, yes. And when you're working with an athlete, don't expect them to do, you know, something that's, you know, you can sometimes, it's not like a, you know, you know, a rule, but it is like, go, go meet them where they are. And most of the time with an athlete, athlete, what they know, go meet them there and then bring them on. Yeah, I, I, I will agree just a little thing. Beside once I went to kickboxing boxing with a sack and this because I wanted to try this and I thought it's a lot <laughs> of fun. And the trainer knew what, uh, what is my work, like a fan Christ practitioner and also a pianist and this all. And it was really like, so, hey, he said, you can knock this. It's, it's not hurting. Go over it. And I really was like, yes, uh, without it, I could, but it is so deep inside, but I love it to do, but I couldn't stand the, so I'm interested in a lot of things and okay with the children, but I imagine it was like, it was so deep inside me not to knock or to go into this. It was, yeah, no, <laughs> that's not me. But it's, uh, I like the experience to do this and to, to think about, okay, I can do this, but I have to train it. And maybe it's good to do this also sometimes, not only like my background is so I, different. <laughs> I, I think you should do it. I think, I think yeah. it would be learn, learn to do it and then not do it. Yeah. But learn to do it. Yes. Yeah, so. yes. Yeah. It was a lot of fun. I hope it, yeah. <laughs> Uh, I forgot, I, 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 did we answer, I forgot the question that we started off on just before, but I, I hope we answered it, whatever that was. Of course, <laughs> I have no doubt. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> so, um, um, but really at the moment, I'm a little bit running out of questions, but this gives me yeah. a good possibility to ask you if there's something inside you what you want to talk about what you think should be said or you ever wanted to talk about and um yeah um i there's a there's a uh i think of course i think this work is extremely um special of course, I wouldn't be doing it for such a long time. Um, and and I have a deep amount of gratitude to Russell Delman and, and to Anat for uh, creating the circumstances where I can, because I spent a lot of time with Russell. Um, and so I have a, 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 a lot of gratitude to them. I, 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 I think that a lot of people need to, to take and, and honor and give themselves the gratitude that they're willing to continue the exploration. And even when they do something that might feel yucky or not as good as they would like it to be or don't get the, the response from the clientele that they want or their mentors or whatever it is that, it, that they're working on, then understand that, that Moshe didn't have it all figured out either. That, that the, this continuous readjustment, as he said, uh, going uh, to the moon, you know, they're, they, they, they're continually making adjustments along the way to get there and, and to honor that within you with compassion and empathy towards yourself. Because um, when you do that, your work gets better. Um, and and uh, I, 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 I see that a lot, I see it in myself. I see that a lot with younger practitioners like, oh, I'm supposed to have it already. I'm supposed to know it already. And, 
And, and, and that's just not the way it is. I mean, that, that's just not the way it is. It's a, it's a, a, a continuous process of learning. And if I could get anything across, I mean, I, I hope I've said some things that are worthwhile that people take away from it, but, but, but that piece allows for this piece that I'm talking about now allows for greater and greater growth and learning and, and a proficient proficiency in the work. So I think that's one of my big things that I'd like to tell younger practitioners. And for people maybe who want to come to the Fenkreis method at first? Um, I, I, I would say um, come, there's a song by a, a group of, and shows my age uh, called Sly and the Family Stone. It was getting to know you, getting to know yourself again. There's a song like, um, oh. get, get to know yourself again. And I think um, I, I think because uh, because socialization, no matter where we live, we we put on these facades, these these masks, and um, if you're interested in uh, knowing yourself much more intimately and having much more of a genuine life, that doesn't mean an easier life. But a more, but a more genuine life, more accurate. I think uh, the Feldenkrais method is for you. If you want to stop doing things that you know hurt yourself or create harm to others, um, you have to know how, what you're doing so you can do what you want. I don't think there's a better way to do that than the Feldenkrais method. What a wonderful sentence at the end. I think, and I agree totally. I, I can say yes, 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 and again, yes. <laughs> so <laughs> happy to yeah. hear from you and to have this nice uh, connection. But I think all the Fenkreis practitioners have this background and th this thinking. And so then I like to say goodbye. Well, thank you. For, let me say thank you for taking the time um, to have our conversation. And I so appreciate this um, and appreciate you for, for, for this. Uh, uh, and, uh, oh, um, can I just say, are you going to put up anything about my website in case people or my yes. email? Oh, yes. Yeah, That's okay. so Martin, please, uh, you, um, that it's below the, um, uh, the podcast, there will be your internet, uh, your, yes, your website, the link to your website and everything so that okay. you can check out about your work. And this is so, and also all people who like this podcast was, <laughs> who stay with us until now please share yeah. it to other people you like it other people will like it and so um that you can talk about it with them or you can give a comment uh, below and everything so that's also maybe important to say spread it to the world i'm happy about it because i say this so loudly sometimes people ask me if they can share it. So it's really interesting, but really you have uh, the right to, to spread it. <laughs> I, I would thank like you. To. Yes. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so very, very much for your time and your, your generosity and your kindness. It was uh, really beautiful. And, and I hope to meet you one day in person. Yes, I hope so. Everyone is like, Uh, ha have a hunger to meet <laughs> but otherwise this is a good situation we have with the zoom and everything that we can meet like this it's not the best thing but it is better than nothing <laughs> so yeah. I, i'm looking forward when we can have all this more social interacting again so Me too, me too. Well, thank you very, very much again. I do appreciate it. Thank you. Brit
Virtual hug, virtual yes, hug. Yes, goodbye. <laughs> Or like we do in Northern Germany, you do like this hugging and then pushing on the back. So like, wow, yeah. That, that's <laughs> very good. <laughs> Bye. 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 Thank you.